Um, okay, let's pray. Father God, thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for the wind and the rain and the coolness. Lord, it's just thank you for your awesome creation. God, you are in charge. You are um, sovereign. You hold the world in your hand, God. And uh, in today's scripture, Lord, you, get, uh, you reveal your glory. So we're excited to look at it, God. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen? Amen. Okay, so yesterday, when was the last time I talked? How do I remember? Tuesday? No, Wednesday. Wednesday at 4. Right? Remember, he was asleep. Oh, yeah. yeah, Wednesday at 4. So Jesus, this is interesting now, he pushes them to say, who do you say I am? And then he like reveals who he is, the Messiah. In fact, it's kind of classic because Peter actually guesses correctly. And Peter gets like a few shining moments of being correct before Jesus then explains what the Messiah is actually going to do, which is what? Be killed, be buried, and then be resurrected, resurrected, right? And Peter's like, no, man, that's never going to happen. And Jesus lovingly calls him what? Satan. Satan. (laughs) Get the behind me, Satan. Why does he say that? Because you have not in mind the things of God, but the things of Men And the things of men is always about power and authority, which is interesting because that's actually going to come up at 4 o'clock today when I teach um, the second session on Luke today, where Jesus is going to predict his death, and they still aren't going to get it. Because remember, Satan's all about earthly power, authority, bucks, that kind of thing. And so that's why Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. You don't have the things of God in mind, but the things of men. So Jesus predicts his death and immediately everybody like rejects what I call the plan. And I say everybody because I think really Peter spoke on behalf of everybody. No, this is, what, this is in effect what they say. No, this isn't how it's supposed to work. The Messiah is supposed to come. And what are they expecting the Messiah to do? Help me out. Say that again, Seth. Kill all the Romans. Kill all the Romans, right. And reestablish the earthly kingdom of David. Because remember, the kingdom of David was like the highlight of Israel's, their whole existence. They peaked at David. And now the Messiah is supposed to be like son of David, right? They think he's going to come back and reestablish, um, a, I want to say an earthly kingdom, but an earthly kingdom that looks like what they're expecting. And so when Jesus actually shares with them the actual plan, and if you're taking notes, make plan with a capital P, the plan, right? They reject it. Now, it's interesting because them rejecting the plan is followed immediately by today's story. And I want to show you the connection because I think it's super freaking cool. So today we're going to be talking about the transfiguration. So if you're writing notes, You can title today's talk, The Transfiguration, where Jesus reveals his glory. So let's briefly unpack the glory of God. What is the glory of God? Okay, the Old Testament talks a lot about the glory of God and who gets to see it. You know, the glory of God filled the temple. Um, God reveals his glory to Moses. Um, You know, um, in fact, if anything, um, well, I'm going to come back to this in just a second. I think I brought this up. I did bring this up really short, briefly last Sunday, if anybody paid attention last Sunday's sermon, anybody, Bueller, Bueller, um, about uh, the, when God reveals his glory to Moses, but I think we'll come back to that in a second, yeah? So um, this is interesting. When Isaiah was doing all his, you know, the book of Isaiah is, a, you know, what is it? I mentioned it on Sunday. 42 different specific prophecies about Jesus, and maybe more. That was kind of one number I landed on, depending on how you view a prophecy of Jesus. It was probably minimum of 20 and maximum like 70 or something. But I think 42 is pretty safe, right? And here's one of the predictions about the Messiah that Isaiah makes in chapter 40, verse 5. He says this, And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and mankind together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So, What exactly is the glory of God? Or at least I'm going to tell you a couple quick things about the glory of God from Scripture. Again, the word is used a lot um, in the Bible. Um, Sometimes, by the way, it refers to just people doing stuff. Like, oh, he got a lot of earthly glory for, you know, he won the battle. Um, The glory will go, uh, I think it was Deborah says, um, hey, uh, I will fight your battle for you, Gideon, but um, the glory 
of the victory will go to a woman instead of you. So that's earthly glory, whatever. But specifically when it comes to regarding to God, it is the self-manifestation. In fact, just the manifestation of God is what the Bible refers to as his glory. But chiefly, is the glory is the possession and the characteristic of Yahweh. And remember, Yahweh means I am that I am. And so the root word for glory in the Hebrew is, I can't pronounce Hebrew, kabdach, right? But I want to tell you one, one thing about the glory of God that's interesting. When we think of glory, let me ask you this. Like if I was just expl- ex- define glory, is there a word that comes to mind? Anybody? No? No word comes to mind? You know what I think? Okay, Lexi doesn't. I think of light, yeah? Like I think of a bright, shining light. And that's kind of based on today's story and actually something that happens to Moses. But just so you know, the root word of glory doesn't actually use the word light at all. But I think it's more interesting. The word for glory in the Hebrew translates more like the word weight or heaviness. I thought that's kind of interesting. Like, wow, God, he's so heavy, right? Right? One thing I like about that, especially, did you guys read The Great Divorce? Notice something interesting happens in the great divorce. When the guys come up from purgatory or hell or wherever they're supposed to be, remember like the guy can't even lift up a leaf? Remember that? And, and it says that he's walking on grass, but the grass is like spiking through his shoes, right? And, and the ghosts can't pick anything up because they're like lightweight. As opposed to the beings that come to greet them on horseback. Remember what happens when they approach? It says the earth shakes. Boom, boom, boom. Because of their what? Heaviness, right? In other words, this. I love this idea. It's just a small concept, but it's rooted in the word glory. And that is this. When we think of spiritual things, we think of ghosts, don't we? Ghosts that are kind of like a fog or something. You guys don't remember the movie Ghost, do you, with Patrick Swayze? Anybody see that? You saw that, Lily? No. Are you familiar with it? So, okay, when, okay. in the movie Ghost, <laughs> you should watch that movie just because you've never seen it. It's kind of funny. But this guy, Patrick Swayze, dies, and he becomes a ghost, right? And then the bad guy that actually killed Patrick Swayze is now, like, consoling Patrick Swayze's widow. And it turns out that was the whole plot. He was going to kill Patrick Swayze so he could get Patrick Swayze's wife, right? And Patrick Swayze is like freaking out because he's a ghost. And he can't do anything about it. But then he runs into this one ghost. And this one ghost teaches him that if you try super, super, super hard and you channel all your emotion, you can like knock a pan off the table, right? And so Patrick Swayze does. So the guy that kills Patrick Swayze, the bad guy, is like on a couch with Patrick Swayze's widow. And he's kind of starting to bust a move, you know, to lean in to kiss her. And Patrick Swayze, can I have that pen back? Do you have it? Patrick Swayze, as a ghost, is like, ah, and he, and then the girl's like, what was that? And she gets kind of freaked out. And so she doesn't like make out with him. And then the movie continues. But what I want you to pay attention to that part of the movie was, notice that the ghost, who we would consider, what, a spiritual being, right, has no power and no weight. It's like a wispy, right, like like something formed with a fog or something. Here's what I want to teach you, if you get nothing else out of today's lesson, is what the Bible teaches is that God is a greater reality than what we're experiencing right now. Does that make sense? In other words, what we're experiencing right now, the Bible refers to as a shadow or an illusion even. Does that make sense? Yeah? Like this is just like a preliminary of the deeper reality of God. That's why I find it interesting that the Hebrew root of the word for glory in the Bible means weight or heaviness. The glory of God isn't wispy, it's thick. Does that make sense? Okay. Lots more to say on about that tonight, but um, let's pick up the story. In fact, um, be, actually, before we read the first verse tonight, uh, today, <laughs> sorry, you know, in my notes, it all says tonight because I've taught this before on Tuesday evening, so keep saying tonight, but whatever. 
I'll say that at 4 o'clock tonight. Okay, um, let me just read you a brief example of the glory of God from Exodus chapter 24. Moses goes up a mountain. So go, Moses goes up on a Mount Sinai. Exodus 24, 16. You don't have to turn there. I'll read it to you. And this is what it says. And the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. For six days, the cloud covered the mountain. And on the seventh day, the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. Now, by the way, at one point, Moses tells God, I want to see your glory. Or he asks God, I want to see your glory. God answers, no, because nobody can see my glory, see my face, and yet live. So what does he do? Does anybody remember this from Sunday's sermon? Yes, Trisha. He got to see God in his receding Yeah, he got to see, he got a glimpse of God's receding backside. Now, here's what's interesting. He tells Moses, he says, um, I'm going to hide your face, right? So, you, so I don't destroy you. Then I'm going to pass by. And after my glory passes by, you can get a glimpse. So I love what happens next. This is what happens. God's glory goes by. Moses just gets to get a glimpse of the retreating backside of God. And it gives him a sunburn on his face. How do I know that? Well, because three days later, Moses goes down the hill, right? And everybody in the camp freaks out. And what do they say? Cover your face. Because the glory of God, the splendor of God is terrifying. There's always a fear element in the glory of God. And what I love is the fact that the three-day-old glory of God from his retreating backside is so powerful that even reflected on the face of a sinful man is enough to make people go, ah, hide your face. Too much glory. Pretty amazing, yeah? Does that give you a little bit of a hint of the whiff of the heaviness of the glory of God? Anybody? Bueller? Okay. So, how many days did the cloud cover the mountain, and on what day did Lord call Moses from within the cloud? Six, seven. seven days. So, on the seventh day, the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. Now, I have no idea what this has to do with verse 28, but verse 28 says this. We're in Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verse 28. 28. About eight days. Isn't that curious? Eight days. I don't know. After Jesus said this, he took Peter... John and James with him, and they went up onto a mountain to pray. So Jesus takes like kind of the, the three amigos, I wrote, the inner circle. By the way, this is the inner, inner circle, right? Because if you're Jesus and you're preaching to 10,000 people, then you have like the apostles and the women, then you have the actual 12 apostles, and then within the 12 apostles, you have kind of the three most important apostles, right? Peter, James, and John. So this is the inner inner circle, and they go up to um, this mountain. We don't really know what mountain, and this is what happens. Verse 29, as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Have you ever seen a flash of lightning? Of course you have. How bright are his clothes if they're as bright as a flash of lightning? Too bright. Too bright. You can't, yeah, thank you. You can't even look at it, like, ah, right? Doesn't that kind of remind you of like, like what Moses maybe got a glimpse of or something and why, you know, three days later people still couldn't handle the sunburn? By the way, do you get it? The sunburn, S-O-N. Uh, yeah, yeah. A glory burn, yeah, it's a glory burn. You know, I wonder if they have like glory screen. Yeah, anyways. <laughs> but look, in the book of Matthew, uh, it says he glowed like the sun. And in the book of Mark, Mark has a really interesting one. In the book of Mark, it says his clothes became whiter, whiter than anybody could ever bleach. Isn't that interesting? Like, oh, wow, somebody, you know, has some really white clothes. I always thought if somebody, um, you know, working for a marketing company was going to market laundry soap, wouldn't that be a good, what if you called your laundry soap glory, right? <laughs> Never mind. You give me, uh, I think I'm in 29. Where am I? Yeah, uh-huh. It doesn't say like a flash of lightning. No, oh, that is underwhelming. Wait, is that an NIV? What year are you in? Uh, New King Which, by the way, is probably a better translation than the. I've got dazzling white. Is that new NIV or old? 
Oh, ESV, yeah, and ESV is better. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry, I'm reading out of the NIV. You know what NIV stands for? No, it stands for nearly inspired version. <laughs> you can write that down, that's a joke. Uh, it's just not a super good translation. ESV and NKJV are actually better translations to the Greek. But in any case, Matthew and Mark both say that Jesus was transfigured before them, which comes from a really interesting Greek word you might already be familiar with, which is metamorpho, like as in metamorphosis. What is a famous insect that goes through a metamorphosis? Yeah, a caterpillar goes through a metamorphosis and it becomes a butterfly. Um, one of the definitions of metamorpho is this, a changing form revealing what is inside. So if you're writing in your notes, the Greek word is metamorpho, P-H-O-O, phu, like foo fighters. And the definition is changing form, revealing what is inside. So Jesus is revealing what's inside. Now, this is interesting because when Moses went up the mountain, God revealed his glory and shines on his face. What's different here? This time, Jesus goes up the mountain, which is interesting because it's kind of making Jesus out to be like a new Moses, only there's a huge difference. He is the one with the glory. Does that make sense? What does that say about Jesus? He is God. Good job, Nick. Exactly. He is God. He is God revealed. Excellent. Yeah. Just as God revealed his glory to Moses on the mountain, now Jesus has gone up and he has become transfigured, metamorphosed, as it were, and he reveals his glory to James, John, and who? Peter. I <laughs> just seem to be paying attention. That's all. Yeah. What's that, Zach? Say again? They should retitle this as the Armageddon. They should what? Reach, retitle it. Retitle this as the Armageddon? Yeah, it's got, it's got a whiff of sure, the... No, not Armageddon, apocalypse. Apocalypse, like yeah. The original meaning of apocalypse. The original meaning of apocalypse. Yeah, I, su I suppose. But anyways, just so you know, could it get any more cooler? No. And it does. Yeah, it can. Check this out. Verse 30. The fun's only just beginning. Verse 30. Two men... Moses and Elijah appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus, and they spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment in Jerusalem. Okay, Moses and Elijah. First of all, how did they know it was Moses and Elijah? It must have been revealed to them. I don't know. It had to be revealed. I pictured Moses. Maybe Moses was holding two tablets, you know, Ten, ten Commandments. Anybody? Bueller? What would Elijah hold? Elijah would just be crying. Isn't he the weeping prophet, right? Elijah's the weeping prophet, right? Jeremiah. Oh, that's Jeremiah. Never mind. What would Elijah be doing? Standing there. Dry bones? Yeah, yeah, holding dry bones, maybe. Yeah, that's good. Madison? Doesn't the prophecy say Elijah will come back? No, that's Ezekiel, sorry. Oh, the, with the bones. Yeah, you're right. It is Ezekiel. But no, no, yeah, you are correct. Some... Yeah, that's, that's probably good. The fact of the matter is we don't really know how they knew, but apparently... They did know. One thing that's a possibility about that is, um, and this is a vague teaching and I'm on thin ice, so just take this next teaching with a real grain of salt. But I read this. When we're all in heaven, we're going to have new bodies, right? New, we might look completely different, but apparently people will be able to recognize us even in our new bodies. So there might be something kind of like what Lexi suggested. It was revealed to them that these two dudes show up and they just know. Like, they just know. Oh my gosh, look, it's Moses and Delilah. Delilah. <laughs> Moses, <laughs> Moses and Elijah. Yeah, let's rethink that one. Okay, now, this is, this is kind of cool. Because Moses and Elijah both have something in common that now Peter, James, and John have in common with Moses and Elijah. They also met with God at the top of a mountain, right? So we have now Moses, Elijah, James, Peter, and John are all like, all have this one thing in common. Did you have your hand raised? Yeah. Yes. I couldn't tell. You were giving me like this weird, sp she's like looking at me like this. And I'm like, I'm like, okay. Yes, Spock, yes. Maybe God addressed them as Moses and Elijah. Yeah, maybe Jesus went, yo, Mo. Eli, 
<laughs> right? Mo and Eli. Yeah, it's possible. It is possible. It is possible. Maybe, maybe, Mo, maybe he introduced them. Guys, <laughs> Moses, Elijah, Peter, James, John, Moses, Elijah, doctor, doctor. Okay, yeah. Now, um, okay, a couple of cool things going on here. Moses and Elijah. Now, Moses represents the law with a capital L, right? Moses is always a picture of the law. Anybody want to guess what does Elijah represent? The, the prophets, right? So Moses represents the law. Um, Elijah represents the prophets. This is, there's a key um, cross-reference here in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Jesus says, do not think I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have come to fulfill them. Isn't that interesting? Jesus is going to fulfill the law. Jesus is going to fulfill the prophets, right? Now we have a situation where we have the representative of the law, the representative of the prophets, and we have Jesus himself who will fulfill both. See, there's a lot going on here. You had a question? Uh, what yes. was that cross reference? Did you cut your hair? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Brad. I actually didn't recognize you. I was like, is he one of the new guys who I don't know yet? Sorry, super random, but I'm like, oh, I know you. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, Brad. Matthew, oh, sorry, good question. Matthew 5, 17. Jesus says, don't think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've come to fulfill them. So now we have up on the mountain, Jesus, the law, the prophets, right? And we have the, the, the prophets to them. And we have James, Matthew, and what do we have? James, Peter, and John. Okay, it's probably more like Peter, James, and John, but whatever. Okay, it gets even more interesting. Okay, check it out. What were they talking about? His departure. Reminds us both of his decease, with which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. So the word that they translate for this is out of the what do you call the Latin Septuagint or whatever. They the same word that they translate either departure or you have deceased or what else do you have? Deceased. They spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish. Okay, what does anybody else have anything else? Does anybody else have departure? Yeah, departure. Okay, so the same Latin word or that they use in the Septuagint or whatever like that is the same word they use in the Old Testament for exodus. Dun, dun, or his exit or exodus. Huh, that's really interesting. So think about this. Okay, now I want to go back to something I said earlier. Remember when um, Jesus gave the first prediction of um, what's going to happen to him? And everybody rejected it, right? And what did I say? They rejected the plan, right? The messianic plan. Now we've got Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. And what are they discussing? Exodus. The Exodus. The plan. His departure. They weren't asking, what flight are you on out of Ben Gurion Airport out of Tel Aviv? His departure, right? They were talking about his leaving. They're talking about the plan. Now, this is interesting for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, we always kind of wonder, what did Jesus know, right, about his future? You know, did Jesus know the whole thing? Did he know the crucifixion? Did he know about the resurrection? Well, we don't know when he knew about all that, but I think we can deduce from this little section, section right here that this is what they're discussing his exodus out of the earth, right? And so don't miss this either, that both Moses and Elijah had been a major part of the role of, of sort of setting up, bless you, and putting this plan into place. Okay, so you're seeing everything that's going on here? Jesus goes up the mountain. His glory is revealed. Moses, Elijah show up, the law, and the prophet shows up, and they start discussing the very plan, right, that the apostles had just rejected. Isn't that interesting? Yeah? This is a full validation of God's plan about what is going to happen to Jesus. Now, before we um, continue on here, can we just pause for one second? First of all, two things. Poor Peter, guys, must be losing it, <laughs> right? I mean, think about this. If you are an observant Jew living in Israel 2,000 years ago, 
could there be any perhaps more amazing thing to have happen in your life than to go up a mountain and be up there with Moses, <laughs> Moses and Elijah? <laughs> like, we always kind of read this and we're like, oh, yeah, so Moses and Elijah. Hello, Moses and Elijah showed up. They're Jews, and there's Moses, and there's Elijah. I mean, what would be a similar... It's amazing, like, this must have just blown their minds, okay? And secondly, and this is just a kind of a wacky science fiction thing to throw at you, but if you guys like wacky science fiction stuff, somebody, somebody suggested this to me after I preached on these verses last year, and I was like, okay, there's no way I believe this happened, but it's kind of a funny thing to think about. So God exists outside of time, right? So how we always picture this, is, okay, this is really stupid, but I like stupid, right? And I like to think about stupid things. We tend to think that this incident happened 2,000 years ago, right? So 2,000 years ago in earth time, Peter, James, and John, who were alive, go up. And then where did Moses and Elijah come from? Heaven, right? We kind of assume they've been in heaven, and God's like, okay, we're going to have a powwow. Like, hey, rally up, everybody. We're going to rally. We're going to get Moses, Elijah, Peter, James, and John together. So I'm going to pull Moses and Elijah out of heaven, and then I'm going to bring Peter, James, and John up the hill. Okay, what if it was just one meeting? Because what do the other two guys have in common? A mountaintop meeting with God. What if he did it all at one shot? So when he's done with the meeting, Moses goes back to the Israelites in the desert, right? <laughs> Elijah goes back to the northern kingdom of Israel where he was prophesying. And Peter, James, and John go back to the apostles. I think there would be physical evidence of that. Just saying. Just saying. Just saying. How do you know Moses? How do you know? We don't know everything. How many days was Moses up on the mountain? 40. Yeah, 40. Maybe he called, maybe he called old Peter. Yeah. Who can't? Moses can't just hop out of time and go 40. Really? How about like when Daniel witnesses the return of Christ? And I saw one coming as, as a lamb who was slaughtered. That's sure what Yeah, exactly. But was he not taken out of time to go see that? Like when Isaiah goes up to the temple, is he still in linear time or is he somewhere else? And here's the thing, Lexi, just so you know, let's not argue because we can't prove any of this. Yeah, I'm just saying. How weird. Anyways. OK, so let's wake the guys up. Verse 32, 33. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, yeah, you think? <laughs> they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. And as the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And he did not know what he was saying. Poor Peter, right? Um, Peter always opens his mouth and then gets scoldings for it, which is about what is going to happen. But it's a couple things going on here. Peter might be blowing his mind right now. People are going, well, why does, people wonder, why does Peter want to build three shelters? Was it going to rain? Some have speculated, well, maybe Peter was like, hey, this is so awesome. I can't believe it. I'm hanging out with Moses and Elijah, and I've just seen Jesus glorified. I don't want this to end, yeah. right? Let's continue this on. Let's hang out for a while. But I want to share one more likely thing for you, uh, with you right now. I didn't know this, and I had to go look it up and found out it was true. Apparently, this happens during the Feast of Tabernacles. Oh, yeah. Feast of Booths or Tabernacles. What do they do during the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles, Nick? They build tabernacles. They build tabernacles. Did you ever see that episode in The Chosen? They're all, they're all building their tabernacles and their booths because they're going like, to reflect back on their time. In fact, it's kind of funny if you think about it. Moses is their Feast of Tabernacles. Because it's, it's, you know, the Feast of Tabernacles is to remember the time of Moses when the poor Israelites didn't have permanent houses, but they had to live in tents. That's what the whole thing 
was about. Okay, so perhaps that's it. It's also possible that Peter thought perhaps, oh wow, this is the ushering in of God's kingdom, and it got to happen without all that ugliness that Jesus said would happen, which is him being killed and resurrected. Because remember, Jesus had just said, I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. So some people speculate, maybe Peter's going, hey, the kingdom of God has arrived, and, you know, and Jesus didn't have to die. Hooray, I'll build a tent in celebration of that. However, once again, Peter has spoken out of turn because he doesn't know what's going on. And so God basically says to shut up. Because look what happens in verse 34. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and they were as afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came from the cloud saying, this is my son who I have chosen. Listen to him. Now, I wrote in my notes, this is a divine Peter. Shut up. <laughs> Poor Peter. Poor Peter, like just, just within like the last week, he got like full like pat on the back for declaring Jesus as the Messiah. That lasts like five minutes before Jesus says, get behind me, who? Satan. Satan, right? He gets called Satan. And now, I love this. Notice what it says, while he was speaking. So there's Peter going, I got an idea. I got an idea. Hey, I can build a temple. And all of a sudden, this voice from heaven, Peter. <laughs> This is my son, capital S in the old NIV, whom I have chosen, listen to him. What was Jesus talking about before Peter interrupted? The departure, the plan. What was, what was Peter's response the first time he heard the plan? No. Yeah, are you seeing the connection now? Are you seeing the connection? Jesus had just told them the plan, and Peter's like, no way, I won't let it happen. Now Jesus is up there speaking about the plan with Moses and Elijah, and Peter's like, hey, I got an idea. God's like, Peter, shut up. Listen to my son, right? Okay. Maybe he is trying to avoid it. Maybe he is. Okay. Okay, I, I got totally off my notes. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, <coughs> Okay, uh, by, by the way, don't miss the point that it's a little bit different in this version. In the other version, it's kind of a more abrupt interruption, but this one kind of gets the cloud in there a little bit different. But re don't miss this part that, again, they're enveloped by a cloud. Um, the NIV comments reckons this is like the same thing as the Exodus glory cloud that covered Moses on Sinai, that filled the temple that Solomon built, that Shekinah glory cloud that guided the Israelites through the desert. Um, by the way, in the book of Matthew, in this very same story, it has all the guys diving to their faces. It says, and they fell to their faces. And by the way, when you look at the Greek word fell, it's more like, it's not like a stumble and a fall. It's a more like diving to their faces. It sounds, sounds to me like what happened was Peter's going, I got a good idea, and then the cloud, and then the voice, and everybody dives to their face. That's kind of what I'm... They don't do it, the first glory thing. What's that? Jesus. Yeah. Jesus? I don't know if it doesn't say Jesus dove to his face. Just all the three? That's what... It, I don't know. What did I say? It was in the book of Matthew. Matthew. It just says the three. It says the three. Oh, there you go. That answers it. Yeah. To quote... Matthew 17. By the way, I wonder what the audible voice of God sounded like. You know? Uh, Morgan Freeman? <laughs> I don't think so, huh? I don't think so. Uh, who else plays God in a movie? Uh, Jim Carrey, yeah, yeah. Evan Almighty. Uh, listen to this. Listen to what Psalm 29. Oh, I'm almost out of time. Oh, we, we started late. I got five minutes, ten minutes. Yeah. Psalm 29, uh, verses 3 to 9. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. Those are trees. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf, Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the desert. 
the Lord shakes the uh, desert of Kadesh, and the voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strips the forest bare, and all in his temple will cry, glory. Ah, you see the connections? We got thunder, we got lightning, we got cloud, we got voice, we got glory. All of that is God's glory, okay? And then lastly, um, verse 35, um, Oh, I just, this is the second part of his third. He says, this is my son whom I've chosen. Listen to him. Now, by the way, this is like straight up proof of the divinity of Jesus Christ. Why do I say that? Well, because there's people out there that say Jesus wasn't divine. I think, is it the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons? I forget which one. Jehovah's Witnesses, I think. Is the Mormons? I think, I think it was the J-dubs that say he's not divine. He's an enlightened being. I don't know. It's one, one, of, one of those two. There are even some so-called messianic uh, Jewish um, sects, only about 10% that don't believe that Jesus is divine. But most people look at this as proof that he is God, because he is God's son. So now we've got the law, we've got the prophets, and we've got the Jesus. The law, the prophets are from God, and we have Jesus, the word, who is God. And, um, and by the way, when he says, listen to my son, it's actually not just for Peter. It's actually for all of us. Like, pay attention. When God's son speaks, we all need to pay attention. Okay? Uh, and I got, let's see, one comment, one final thing before we read the last verse. Okay. This is kind of what I've already said, but I'm just going to read this. This is from John MacArthur. I'm only reading this for Cooper. Because this comes after, G after Jesus reveals for the first time his suffering, his death, and his resurrection, and Peter says it won't happen. Now we see that Jesus is planning the exodus with the physical representations of the law and the prophets. The whole episode shows that this is God's plan. It is not a mistake. So in this context, yeah, um, the lesson is for all of us that God's, God had a plan, this is his plan, and we need to listen to Jesus. Okay, and then lastly, this is a really weird ending to this. Verse 36, when the voice had spoken, um, they found that Jesus was alone. And the disciples kept this to themselves and told no one at that time what they had seen. By the way, do you still have the Matthew version open, Sam? Set Matthew 17? Because I, I don't remember reading. Did Jesus tell them not to tell anybody, or they just decided? Yeah. Yeah, did. Jesus told them, don't tell anybody. Okay, that's kind of what, what I thought. It's kind of what I have in my notes. Now, by the way, we kind of read that, and we go, okay, yeah, don't say anything. Have you ever thought how hard that must have been for those guys? Like, think about this. They come down the mountain. Right? The disciples are like, so where did you guys go? Nothing. <laughs> they just hung out with Moses, Elijah. They saw Jesus transfigured, and they just heard the voice of God from heaven in the, sh in the Shekinah glory cloud. Can you imagine how the tempting that must have been to at least like go, psst, Nathaniel, dude, 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 you're not going to believe what just happened. Right? Well, eventually, obviously, eventually, they told everybody. But it's also possible that, like, people wouldn't even believe them. Really? You saw Moses and Elijah. Yeah, like Lucy. And yeah. yeah, like Lucy. Yeah. yeah. And then they would have said, and how did you know it was Moses? Did he have tablets? <laughs> right? No, Lexi says we just knew. <laughs> it, was, it was revealed to us, right? Uh, maybe Jesus said, hey, don't tell anybody, because he knew that maybe it would piss them all off. Really? No way. How come we didn't get to go up the mountain? And I have one more, one more interesting thought about that. And it's my first application. So I, don't have, I only got a couple applications. But my first application for today's teaching is this. You can refer to this episode as a mountaintop experience. Really? Yeah, you think? That was pretty creative of me, right? But I, what I want to submit to you is, if you haven't already had kind of a mountaintop experience with God. Don't be surprised if sometime in your life you have what I call a mountaintop experience. Now, what do I mean by that? Can you guys guess already what I mean by that? 
a real time when maybe God revealed himself to you in a fairly miraculous way. I've had maybe three in my life. I'm not going to tell you. Remind me some other time. I'll tell you a couple of them that I've had. I've had maybe three in my life where I really felt like, wow, that was like God. Like God, I had an encounter with God. One was like a vision I had while I was praying by myself in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. One was in the front row of the church uh, during the fifth song of the worship set right before I preached. Yeah. And one was a text, uh, actually an email I got on my phone one time on a flight home from Cabo San Lucas, where it was just like, whoa, I cannot deny that I just had an experience with God. But here's the thing about experiences with God that I want to teach you. We are not to live by them or for them. <coughs> what do I mean by that? I don't think we're supposed to live our lives constantly hoping to have some major experience with God. Because if we do, I think we're likely to be disappointed. God has a way sometimes of reaching you and reaching out to you in ways when you don't expect them, in ways that are, um, that are powerful. But I feel like he doesn't do that all the time for us because then we would keep expecting and relying on, on them. I have a friend who recently came to Christ this year, and he's a very energetic, emotional guy that I'm sure God's going to use greatly for his glory because everything he touches, he succeeds in and does well in. And right now, he's always calling me going, Dave, God just did the most amazing thing. I saw the most amazing coincidence. This guy out of nowhere, I'm talking to this guy on the bus, and he starts talking to me about exactly what I was studying in the Bible that day. It's like total proof of God, right? You ever have these experiences? Right? You know people have this? And this is what I keep telling him. Okay, it's good. But just so you know, eventually God is going to want you to study his word and live by his promises and not by experience. Okay? Did you know Mother Teresa, at the end of her life, felt totally abandoned by God? Did you know that? You know who Mother Teresa is? She's kind of famous. Right? All I know is that she, we quote her all the time. We quote her all the time, yeah. Because God wants us to walk by faith, not by sight. Exactly. And faith in what? Faith in his word. Faith in his promises. So these experiences, um, I want to read you a quote from Brennan Manning that I underlined when I read it because it reminded me of this. He calls the, the true self, remember we talked about God, the inner man, the inner man that is being renewed daily. The inner self finds true identity in being totally loved by God in the ordinariness, ordinariness, how do you say that? Ordinariness of life. The true self, the inner self, is grateful for spiritual highs, but without craving them, and likely is not without making too big of a deal about them when they come. Because the true self knows that we encounter God most often in the day-to-dayness of life. Now, I want to add to that by saying another thing. Because Christians do this. We should also not expect everybody else to have the same experience that we had. Does that make sense? Have you ever had somebody tell you, you got to try this, da-da-da? Or you got to go to this church? Or you got to play this song? I'll give you an example of that. My friend, um, Jacob Pierce, he was our youngest worship leader we ever had at KCF. And if you sat through my worship seminar, you've heard this story already, yeah? And when he was in high school... Um, he flew over to the mainland with a bunch of the other high school guys to go to a, you know, a youth conference or whatever. And the worship band played this one song. And when Jacob Pierce came back, he goes, oh, man, dang, we had the most amazing experience, man. Like, the worship band, they played this one song, and they just kept repeating the chorus over and over and over. And by like the 10th time, man, people were falling on their knees and crying. And it was amazing. And I was like, yeah, cool, sick. That sounds awesome. And I didn't think about it at the time. I wish I had thought to warn him. So the next time Jacob Pierce leaves worship at church, guess what song he plays? Guess how many times he plays the chorus? Yeah, at least 10 times. Guess what the reaction was of the congregation? Uh... Wow, is he going to do that chorus again? And then he was all bummed out afterwards. He comes up to me, what's wrong with this church, man? Nobody. And I'm like, bro, I should have told you. I forgot to warn you. Just because you have an experience with God in one way. So my point is this. Can you, the 
2,000-year-old version of that story is Peter, James, and John go back to the apostles, and they're like, dude, dude, we got to go up this mountain. I'm going to take you up this mountain. Check it out. And then they get up to the top of the mountain, and they're like, Where, where's Moses? Where, where's Elijah, right? You see what I'm saying, right? This is called the experience of God. So this isn't our goal. Instead, what we have is we have seasons in our walk with God. Sometimes we have these big moments on the mountain, and sometimes we're slogging through a desert where we don't hear from God, we don't feel the presence of God. That's when we really walk by the promises of God when you don't feel God and you don't see God working. Sometimes you might be in a spiritual orchard where you're bearing fruit like your ministry's firing on all eight cylinders and everything's going really well. And sometimes you might be in a storm at sea, the storm of your life when you're like, where are you, God, right? We go through these different seasons, which is why Paul says this in Philippians 3.12. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on. I love that. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took a hold of me. By the way, that's a great visual illustration. I press on to take a hold of that for which Christ Jesus took a hold of me. Who's got a hold of Paul? Did you catch it? Maybe you missed it. Jesus has taken a hold of Paul. That's what he said. I press on to take a hold of that for which Jesus has taken a hold of me. What's that one verse? Jesus says, um, don't you know I hold you in my hand and from which none can snatch you, right? Look what Paul just said. Jesus has got me and I'm pressing on to grab a hold of that life for which he has me. But I do it from the safety of knowing that Jesus has me. So whether you have mountaintop experiences, valley experiences, desert experiences, orchard experiences, storm experiences, right? We just press on on the promises of God. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father God, thank you for um, this lesson today, God. Um, thank you for revealing your glory at that time. Thank you for validating the plan that indeed it was your plan for you to be killed, to actually be, to suffer, to be killed, and be resurrected on the third day. And thank you that we have eternal life in you because of that. And thank you for making it so clear to Peter and the guys, Lord, that they could pass this on to us, what they got to see and what they got to experience. And Father, I just pray for everybody in this room right now that our walk would be steady as we press on leaning into you, no matter what experiences come from this life, Lord, whether they be great mountaintop or anything else. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen? Sure, man.